All right, well, let's open the Word tonight and spend some time together in the Scriptures. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 28. We'll be there in a few moments. Last Wednesday night, we started a new summer series of midweek messages, zeroing zeroing in on the last phrase of our church's mission statement. We've said for several years now that we state our mission like this, Look to Christ, learn the Word, live on mission. Look to Christ, learn the Word, live on mission. As we mentioned last week, that statement was born out of a a study of the book of Acts. And I think it's a statement that's vitally important for us to remember in days like these. We've been talking for a number of weeks about the difficulty, the struggle, often in our spirits in a season like this one. And as we said last time, when when life gets hard, we often find it difficult to know how we're to respond and what we're to do. We always want to do something when we don't know what to do. We want to do something, at least feel like we're making some kind of headway, but we often don't know what to do. And I suggest, and I said it last time, that the reason we feel that it's so hard to know how to respond or what to do in times like these is because far too easily we forget why we're here. Why are we here in the first place? If I don't know why I'm here, I won't know what to do. And so often that's just the case for us. And this then is why I really want to spend some time considering how our Lord would have us to live in times like these. And we stated it very simply in that last statement of our mission statement, live on mission. We need to remember that our situation may have changed, but our mission has not. The situation may have changed, but the mission has not. In order for us to really know how we're to live as the people in the church of the Lord in these days, we really need to ask another important question. And I'd say it this way, what is the mission of God's people? What is the mission of God's people? Or or as one author duo titled the book that they wrote a few years ago, they asked it this way, what is the mission of God? The church. What's the mission of the church? Is it merely to amass a crowd? Is it it merely, as we've heard about, a wonderful outreach, but is it merely to feed hungry people? Is it to seek out peace in a restless society? Is it to leave a good impression on neighbors? Is it to be thought of as really nice people? And why is the church here? What's the mission of God's people in the world? If we don't answer that question, then we're going to really struggle to know what to do when when we say live on mission. Well, what's that? What is the mission? What are we to be doing? And as much time as we've spent over the years really wrestling with that question, talking about it, teaching through various aspects of what the Scriptures teach about this, it may surprise some of you to learn that there is actually a lot of debate among Christians in exactly how to answer that question. There's a lot of discussion about how to answer the question, what is the mission of God's people? In fact, much ink has been spilled on the subject Some contend that any and all works, spiritual or social, can legitimately be described as the mission of God's people. Like everything I just described to you and a thousand other things, that's all mission. You want to drill wells, you want to dig ditches, you want to build houses, you want to feed people, you want to put shoes on people, you want to collect glasses. All of that is the mission, any of that is the mission of God's people. So kind of on one extreme on this spectrum, anything is mission. Others contend that while the mission of the church certainly has broader implications and maybe some applications, the mission can only be rightly defined in far more narrow, biblical, gospel, discipleship, terms. Certainly there are things that loving people will do. Certainly there are things that Christians will do for love of neighbor. 
But how do you define the mission? Why are we here? What have we been given by our Lord to do? Truth be told, there is quite a spectrum of opinions about this. It's interesting. David Bosch wrote years ago as he thought through missions. And he astutely observed this. He said, since the 1950s, there has been a remarkable escalation in the use of the word mission among Christians. This went hand in hand, he said, with a significant broadening of the concept. At least in certain circles. So among Christians, we kept using the word and it just kept taking on broader and broader and broader meaning. Till it means anything you want it to mean. Anything supposedly Christian is now the mission of Christians. Two authors, DeYoung and Gilbert, comment on this as well when they write, it used to be that mission referred pretty narrowly to Christians sent out cross-culturally to convert non-Christians and to plant churches. But now... Missions is understood much more broadly. Because of this shift, author Stephen Neal, an an Anglican missionary from years and years ago, once famously warned, if mission, if everything is mission, nothing is mission. If everything is mission, nothing is mission. See, brothers and sisters, we could literally spend hours discussing and debating the various ideas and opinions about all of this. I'm not going to bore you with those details. This debate has gone on for decades among Christians. But tonight, what I want to do is I just want to direct your attention to four short passages of Scripture that inform the way that we, as God's people, should be thinking about the mission we've been given by our Lord. In fact, these passages are known as the Great Commission passages. And they serve as our, our starting point for our summer series. They really, it really kind of gets us rolling as we think together about missions. You know, before our Lord ascended to heaven at the end of His earthly ministry, He left His disciples and by extension His church with marching orders. He said, here's what I want you to be about. Here's where I want you to invest your time, your energy, your efforts. Here's what I want you to accomplish. Here's what I, by my Spirit, am going to empower you to do. And he spoke very specifically. I asked you to turn to Matthew 28 because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in their Gospels and the book of Acts, all record a version of this commission. And I want you to see those words, okay? So Matthew 28, you're familiar with the commission. Let's start at verse 16. It's that last paragraph of Matthew. I'm going to read down through verse 20. I want you to see the words. We're going to move right on to Mark, and then to Luke, and then to Acts. I want you to see these records of the commission text. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 16. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's Matthew's record of the commission. I want you to see a verse in Mark chapter 13 where where Jesus again states very plainly this same principle. Mark chapter 13 and verse number 10. Jesus taught about the signs that would be seen at the end of the age. We find in verse 10 and tucked in the middle of that teaching. He says in verse 10, And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Uh, Luke takes this up as well. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. 
Beginning at verse 44, let's read down through verse 49. We find there again Luke's record of the commission. Then he, Jesus, said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Finally, the text we studied last week in Acts chapter 1 You know this text. We looked at it last time, as I said. Verse 8 we read, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, there's a lot to be said, and we won't take a lot of time tonight, but I do want you to consider that there are three key parts to this great commission. If you're thinking through, what are we to glean from this record that three different gospel writers recorded, and one of them recorded it twice? These final words, as it were, of King Jesus to His people. Here's what I'm leaving for you to do. Here's what I'm sending my Spirit to empower you to be about when I'm gone. What are we supposed to glean from the repetition of the language in all of these texts? Well, three things I want you to notice. First of all, I want you to see the sending that happens here. The sending that happens. I think it should be clear to all of us from from reading what we just had that in each of these passages, our Lord was sending His disciples out to do a work that He had ordained for them to do in the world. He makes it plain with language like, Go. I'm going to give you power and you're going to reach into these different regions. So don't miss this. King Jesus did not simply leave His people here on earth to do as they please in the world. He didn't just leave them behind and go, you come up with your mission. You decide what you want to do. You decide what your life is about. You decide where to spend your energies. You decide where to spend your monies. You are in charge of you. No, the king didn't do that. The king said, I am going to send you power. I am going to enable you to be about a specific work. This is why I am leaving you behind. I'm going. I'm sending my spirit. Now do this. He sent his people to do something. It wasn't a matter of you do as you please as long as you attend a few religious services and participate in some religious rituals from time to time. The rest of it's up to you. You just kind of do your thing. Just make sure you tip your hat my way every now and then. That is not how the king left his people. In short, we could say it like this. His plan was not for us to simply insulate ourselves from the world within the four walls of a church building. As though this was our fort, right? We, we come here to be protected. We come here to keep them out, right? That's, that's not what this is about. And yet it is what has crept into the thinking of the, the modern church in many places. Instead of insulating ourselves from the world, He intends for us to go out into, to interact with, and to influence the world around us with truth. This is what He was saying. But we have to ask this question. What was the message? What was the message that he intended for his people to proclaim throughout the world? Clearly, there's a sending here. A sending of his people into the world to do what? To talk about what? To proclaim what? Well, that leads us to a second key point here. Not only do we see the sending, but secondly, as you you kind of survey the Great Commission passages, you see the subject. The subject. Again, these texts are very clear as you read them. The subject that Christ's people are to make much of in the world is Christ Himself. 
Christ himself. In short, you might say it this way. His plan was not for us to, to, to simply hole up here. No, we are to make disciples who obey His commands. We're to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, He says. We're to bear witness to, the, to Christ's righteous life, He said there in Luke. His finished work, the forgiveness that they make possible for truly repentant sinners. I mean, this is the glorious message. And as our Lord said to His disciples in Acts right before He ascended, we are to be His witnesses. Witnesses of Him. I was reading back through these texts and, and considering some questions. I, I just had to, to ask myself, I want to ask all of you, if He sent His Spirit to embolden and empower us to make much of Him, friends, can I ask this question? How much do you make of Him? How often do you speak of Him? We have to ask the question, if that is what He sent His Spirit to embolden us, empower us, enable us to do, then we just have to ask the simple question, all right, how often do we talk about Jesus? I mean, how, how many times in a, in a given day or in a given week does His name even leave our lips? Even in our own homes. Let alone at work. Or with our neighbors. Or with friends. In a letter or an email or a phone call. Or an interaction in public somewhere. I mean, this is what he said. The subject of our mission is Christ. Which begs the question, are we making much of Christ? We've said it here before, we live in a, in a world and in a day when it's fairly safe to talk about God. You want to talk about God and religion and spirituality? Very few will take issue with you. You start to speak of Christ the King and call people to submit and repent. I think there's a reason why his name may not leave our lips very often. Because we know there's a price attached to that. That, that, that. There is going to be an opposition to that reality. If ever there has been a time in which the word bigot is thrown around, it is now. What we understand is even to claim the title Christian is at times in our day to invite the assault of enemies who do not like that message. And yet, the mission, the commission of our king as he left, was to make much of him everywhere. I think all of this is abundantly clear. This is nothing new for most of us. It's just, it's just a refresher course that we need as we start into a series like we're doing this summer. But friends, I think we need to ask another question, and I've just alluded to it with the last comment I made. To whom are we responsible to convey this message? If, if the mission... It's what we've just spoken, right? If this is a sending of our king, a commissioning of his people, if this is about the subject of Christ, that is what the message is about, then we have to ask the question, then who are we to share it with? How far are we to be concerned about spreading the good news? Like, what's my responsibility? What's, what's your responsibility? What's our collective responsibility as a church? There was a day in which uh, the, the mindset of leaders was what was called a parish mentality. 
a, a parish mentality. It, it means that I'm responsible not only for the congregation that I lead, but, but a region. So, so pick, pick a distance, you know, two miles out from the church, three miles out from the church, and this is our, our, our parish. And so we're responsible to make sure our parish hears the good news, right? So our scope is never much more than a mile or two, whatever you can ride in a few minutes on a horse, right? That, that's that's, your, that's your, your, your distance, and, and that's what we're concerned about, right? So I'm concerned about my neighborhood, I'm concerned about my workplace, I'm concerned about whatever, my, my immediate sphere of influence. But the question I asked was this, not only who, but how far are we responsible to carry this message? And so the last point here, the, the third thing I want you to see from the commission is the repeated language through the text that tells us the scope. Not just the sending and the subject, but how about the scope? What's the scope of this commission and of this mission that we've been given by our Lord? Well, in each of these passages, we're told that the church's mission is to reach, and I quote, the nations. The nations. Matthew, he says it plainly, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What did he say in Mark? Mark's record, and this gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Luke 24, he was making it very plain. He said, and the repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, what did he say? You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So let's ask the question then. Let's ask again, what is, the, what is the scope that should actually be in view as we consider our responsibility when it comes to the mission we have been given by our Lord? Friends, hear me. We should certainly, we should certainly desire to reach our neighborhood. We should certainly desire to reach our workplace, our city, our state, our nation. All of these, each one of these, is clearly found within the broader scope of the context, right? All nations includes, guess what? Our nation. All nations includes, guess what? Your neighborhood, your workplace, your family. So, so certainly, you and I should be burdened for our neighbors, our workmates, our family, our friends, our, our, borrow the old line, the parish, right? The region, the neighborhood, where we are, our community. Yes, that should be a weight on our souls. But my question for tonight and for this summer is this. Is that all that should concern us? Is that all that should weigh on our souls? Is that the extent of our burden? And I'll add the word I've used already, our responsibility. We need to face it, friends, when we set our goal as merely our neighborhood as merely our workplace, as merely our community, our city, our state, our nation, we set our sights far too low. Far too low. Because when our Lord spoke and He gave us the mission, His scope was the nation. And his word is filled with those words. We're going to spend some time this summer considering that. And I would say to you that this is why people within the church have historically understood these commission texts 
to be a call to God's people to lift our eyes and to soften our hearts toward the ripe harvest field of the nations. Not merely of the people who look like me and eat what I eat and do what I do and live like I live. But for all those yet outside of Christ. In light of all this, I just want to take a few moments before we close to define some terms. I think it'll help us as we proceed through our study this summer. Uh, thoughtful theologians and writers have really helped do some heavy lifting on these subjects. I'm not going to try to, to reinvent the wheel and come up with an, a, a brand new original definition. I've, I've used a number of definitions over the years. But, but let me just give you some illustrations about how some have helped us. Uh, for instance, David Horner I actually was a, a, a pastor here in Raleigh for a number of years, still lives in Raleigh. He's written a great book on missions. He's offered this bi biblical, it's a general kind of broad definition, but a biblical definition of missions. Missions is God's plan for reaching all nations with the good news of Jesus Christ by sending His people to tell them about and to show them the gracious, redeeming love of a glorious God. Missions is God's plan for reaching all nations with the good news of Jesus Christ by sending His people to tell them and to show them the gracious, redeeming love of a glorious God. It's a great definition. I mentioned to you De Young and, and Gilbert, two authors, teamed up on a book. They were the ones that called their book, What is the Mission of the Church? They've written very similarly to Horner this. In their book, they said, We believe the church is sent into the world to witness to Jesus by proclaiming the gospel and making disciples of all nations. I said, these are great definitions. They really help us, I think, if we're, if we're, if we're following along here, they help us to, to wrap our minds around what we mean when we call our church to live on mission. Uh, friends, for a moment, let me just say this. Since the ultimate goal, the commission has made clear, is the nation's, there's a reason why we talk here often when we talk about mission. We talk about the necessity of engaging in this work of witnessing to Christ locally, regionally, and globally. When we talk about missions here, it's not just a local thing. It's not just a global thing. It's at each of these spheres of influence, we're looking at the scope and we're saying we have a responsibility locally and regionally and globally, to be about this work we've been given to do. Since there's a difference, though, in how we engage in the scope of the mission, it's, it's important, I think, to make sure that we define what we mean by missionary. This is a word that's been used often, and I think to some detriment to its meaning. I'll spend some time, Lord willing, next week in Acts chapter 13. I want to spend some time looking at some of the very first missionaries in Scripture. What are we talking about? Well, some have actually suggested that every Christian is a missionary. You might have heard that before. Everybody's a missionary. And we know what they mean. It's just what we said. We all have a mission to fulfill. We need, we need to be about it. And, and yet, historically, this is not how the church has understood this because of what the Scriptures teach. Just because every Christian is to be a witness does not mean in the same way that every Christian is a pastor. It would be like saying that all the members of the church are equally pastors. Well, they're, they're not. Saying that every Christian is a missionary is very similarly to potentially denigrate the meaning of what this is. Why? 
Because there's more to being a missionary than just being a witness. There's more to being a missionary than just being a witness. You see, as we noted in our text, there's also a, a sending involved. There's a sending involved. This, I think, is why Andy Johnson in his little book on missions from Nine Marks Ministries has offered this clarifying definition. It's a little longer. I'm happy to give it to you if you want it later. But here's how Andy defines a missionary. He says, a missionary is someone identified and sent out by local churches to make the gospel known and to gather, serve, and strengthen local churches across ethnic linguistic, or geographic divides. A missionary is a sent one who is identified by the church and sent by the church to do something that not all of the rest of us are able to do. And when we say things like everyone's a missionary, it at some point in time begins to, 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 to broaden the meaning like using missions to mean everything, now it means nothing. One of, the, one of the saddest things I have seen over the last few years, it just breaks my heart for the American church, is the number of Bible, college, Bible colleges and seminaries that were established for training young men for ministry that are closing at a pace that will make your head spin. Because nobody wants to be in ministry anymore. Nobody wants to give their life to preaching. Or to going. Or to doing. In, in fact, I have missionary friends uh, work in mission boards. And you know what they say? Bible colleges won't even let us come to recruit missionaries at the Bible college campuses anymore. And you know what the number one explanation is? Why Bible colleges aren't letting the missionary boards come anymore? Lack of interest from the students. Students don't care. They're just, they're just not interested. And I would submit to you that over the last few decades, as we've just kind of used language like, well, everybody's a missionary. We've kind of created a monster in the church. And now nobody's interested in actually giving their lives to the end that this mission would be the focus that they would give themselves to till they die. I've said nobody. That doesn't mean there's nobody. But do you understand what I'm saying? There is such a decline. It is alarming. It's heartbreaking. I, I'm hearing stories about the rate at which pastors are leaving the ministry. And there are churches that have been looking for a pastor for two, three, four, seven, eight, nine years just trying to find a pastor. That's in America. That's not even overseas. And I would submit to you that what has happened as we have begun to use language like, well, the mission includes anything. And everything. And missionaries, anybody who walks across the street and tells their neighbor about Jesus, we've actually undermined something that God is calling people to. I, for one, want to be a part of a ministry where we do not undermine that. We actually hold that up as a wonderful thing. For young people to aspire to, should God so desire to use them in that way. You see, a missionary is one identified by the church, sent by the church, to cross a divide of language or geography, to do what? To establish churches, see people one to Christ, bring them into the church, make disciples of Christ. This is an intentional thing. If we had more time tonight, I'd love to, to chase this idea. As I said, I want to come back to this probably next Wednesday night and demonstrate how the, the New Testament bears this idea out and how the, the church has historically understood this to be a good and helpful definition. And it's driven the way they've thought. It, it's driven the way they've prayed. It's driven the way they've given. It's driven the way that parents have spoken to their children. It, it's driven the way that they've interacted with their missionaries. It, it's guided these things. Why? Because they understood that God has given the church a mission that we must be about 
And it's more than kind of a shrug your shoulder. Well, if we get to it, it'll be all right because anything's mission. No, not everything is mission. Every Christian should be on mission. But everything is not mission. But we live in a day in which we've actually made it so meaningless because we've broadened the definition so wide that Neil's warning has actually come true. If everything is mission, then nothing is mission. If everything is mission, then nothing is mission. So tonight, as tonight as we kind of bring this to a close and we prepare for prayer, I, I want to give some thought. I want you to give some thought to where you and I fit in this great commission that's issued to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. Where do we fit? N not everyone has been equipped or called, identified by the church to be sent to go. We know that. We understand that. It, it doesn't mean that it's wrong to stay. In fact, I, I feel like we've done a disservice over the years. I read again, I was reading in a missions book this week, and one of the authors actually made the comment, when, when, when we have said in years past, if you don't have a good reason to stay, well, you better be going. We've actually made a mess of this thing. Because we've, we've actually said things like this. Well, Anybody, regardless of qualification, knowledge of the word, giftedness, willingness, should be going because missionaries can be just about anyone. I, I remember being in, a, in Bible college years ago in, in preaching class. And I know our profs did not intend to do this, but you know what? If you were at all exciting when you preached, you'd be like, man, you're, 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 a, you're an evangelist. If you were rather technical, you were proficient, but you weren't, you know, keeping people's eyes open all the time. But you were, you were decent with your content. Well, you were a pastor. And if you couldn't preach your way out of a paper bag, you were a missionary. Brothers and sisters, that breaks my heart. That we would actually think with the kind of pride that would say, whatever wouldn't qualify to be in our church, we'll send overseas. Whoever I wouldn't sit and listen to for an hour, let's send him to the nations. Whoever's not real, we're not really sure he knows his Bible that well, and he really, he really can't declare these things for us. Let's send him to the people who desperately need our best, not our leftovers. And yet there's been something happening in American missions and American churches for, for decades now. And, and I can go back to basically post-World War II and demonstrate to you the decline in the American church for the last 70 years. I show it to you historically. And, and it's led to a point where now there are things that are just kind of normal in the way the American church thinks that when it comes down to it aren't biblical. They're just not biblical. And what I'm praying for us is that we will wrestle with this question. Where do I fit? Where do you fit in this question of the commission? I'm praying this as a parent. Where do my kids fit in this? I mean, I, I've gotten to the point of the last few years where I've actually begun to pray like this. God, if you won't send me to the nations, will you please send my daughters? Parents, would you pray like that? If you're not sending me to the nations, would you send my kids? You see, in America, we pray things like this. God, don't take my kids too far, right? Keep them close. But I think a Christian who understands the commission says, we've only got so much time, so much energy, so many resources. We've got a really big mission. We must be about it. We must be about it.
we said last time, brothers and sisters, we must live on mission. Tonight I want us to realize and I want us to go from here remembering that the mission is so much bigger than we might naturally think it is. It is a wonderful thing when God's people are moved of God to evangelize in their neighborhoods and workplaces. It's a glorious thing. But we have to understand it's bigger than my cul-de-sac. It's bigger than my community. It's bigger than my county. It's bigger than my country. The mission is the nations. And we as a church, and we as individuals, I pray, will be being convinced of this to the point that it changes the way we think and it changes the way we pray and it changes the way we give and it changes the way we live to the end that God is glorified, Christ is exalted and the nations are now praising him with us because he is worthy of their praise. So tonight as we pray, would you pray with me to the end that God would do a work in us with his word like that. All right.